Welcome, everyone. Welcome to our service. Um, I do have a pastoral letter from Bishop John. It, it is fairly lengthy, and let me just apologize in advance for my pronunciation of the tribal name. Um, so, to all the people of the Diocese of New Westminster, the discovery of the mass grave at the Kamloops Indian Residential School and the remains of 250 children buried there has shocked us all. The reporting of horrors of abuse and brutality at residential schools is not new to us, but this burial site has brought into sharp focus the structural disrespect, cultural violence, and cruelty that took place on a regular basis. We cannot ignore that 215 children were buried without markers, without notification to families, and likely little or no ritual or ceremony of burial. How are we to respond with so many emotions swirling around and within us? It is a difficult but painful truth that some of those children were potentially baptized in the Anglican Church and quite possibly in our Diocese of New Westminster. We have a connection to this ghastly discovery, much as it might shock us to understand that. A journey is taken one step at a time, and the journey of reconciliation is a lifetime pilgrimage, not something soon done and finished. We are on that journey, and we must seek ways to continue and never give up. On August 6, 1993, the then primate of the Anglican Church of Canada, Archbishop Michael Piers, said this to Indigenous people of Canada. I accept and I confess before God and you, our failures in the residential schools. We failed you. We failed ourselves. We failed God. I am sorry, more than I can say, that we were part of a system which took you and your children from home and family. I am sorry, more than I can say, that we tried to remake you in our image, taking from you your language and the signs of your identity. I am sorry, more than I can say, that in our schools, so many were abused physically, sexually, culturally, and emotionally. On July 12, 2019, the primate of that time, Archbishop Fred Hilt, said this, I confess our sin in failing to acknowledge that as First Peoples living here for thousands of years, you had a spiritual relationship with the Creator and with the land. I confess our sin in demonizing indigenous spiritualities and in belittling the traditional teachings of your grandmothers and grandfathers preserved and passed on through the elders. I confess the sin of our arrogance in dismissing indigenous spiritualities and disciplines as incompatible with the gospel of Jesus and insisting that there is no place for them in Christian worship. I confess our sin in acts such as smothering the spud smudges, forbidding the pipes, stopping the drums, hiding the masks, destroying the totem poles, silencing the songs, stilling the dances, and banning the potlatches. With deep remorse, I acknowledge the intergenerational spiritual harm caused by our actions. I confess our sin in declaring the teachings of the medicine wheel to be pagan and primitive. I confess our sin in robbing your children and youth of the opportunity to know their spiritual ancestry and the great wealth of its wisdom and guidance for living in a good way with the Creator, the land, and all peoples. For such shameful behaviors, I am very sorry. These are the words of two former primates of our Anglican Church, words that have much to offer us now. But at a time like this, we need to listen deeply and intently and hear from indigenous voices, not only from settlers. Archbishop Mark MacDonald, National Indigenous Archbishop, recently said this. I once heard someone say that Jesus, who died on the cross, also died in the Holocaust. If that is true, they will find him among those children buried in Kamloops. But we who have seen him die on the cross and suffer with us know that this is not the end of the story. He came back to us whole and sound in a resurrection body 
from the world to come, a world that he said we could start living in now through love, through prayer, through sacred circle, and through his body and blood. His justice, his truth, his love is walking in us and through us towards that day, and we have seen it. It will rise, is rising, with those children and with a truth that could not be hidden. This is a time to listen, to listen to the voices of First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples, to listen to their pain, their truths, their voices, their understanding, to listen to how we live into reconciliation, not with words alone, but actions that build hope and compassion and new life to listen and find a way to keep moving forward on this path to reconciliation. Chief Robert Joseph once said, true reconciliation fundamentally is about relationships. It means that you and I can coexist in mutual respect and all of us can afford each other dignity. May we live into this hope aware of the harm and violence that has taken place, but seeking true reconciliation by listening and responding with action." End quote. With this in mind, here is a section of Tkomi Roseanne Casimir's Chief of the Kamloops Kutskwak May 31st media re release. Regrettably, we know that many more children are unaccounted for. We have heard that the same knowing of unmarked burial sites exists at other former residential school grounds. It was something that the TRC raised in the early days of their work. However, it was not part of their original mandate. The TRC fought for it to be included and were turned down twice by the federal government. That said, TRC is the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, was nonetheless able to do some important work on the topic, and we encourage you to revisit their um, paper, Canada's Residential Schools, Missing Children and Unmarked Burials, the Final Report of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada, Volume 4. For further important context, we also direct your attention to the report, Where Are the Children Buried?, completed by Dr. Scott Hamilton. The report addresses the question where deceased Indian residential school students are buried. This is difficult to answer because of the varying circumstances of death and burial, coupled with the generally sparse information about residential school cemeteries. It requires a historic understanding of school operations that contextualizes the patterns underlying death and burial. We ask all Canadians to reacquaint themselves with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission final report and calls to action, upholding the heavy lifting already done by the survivors, intergenerational survivors, and the TRC. In addition to show your solidarity, we encourage you to wear an orange shirt and start conversations with your neighbors about why you are doing so. Tkumloops Tkaskwamp is now accepting donations that will automatically be deposited into a separate account set up for this initiative. And there's an email don't address. There is no other fundraising initiative that the tribe has authorized or is participating in at that this time. End quote. May God guide us to move forward in ways that honor, renew, renewed relationships, and with determination that there must be a change in how we share this land with Indigenous people, how we uphold with respect and resolve the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of this country, the Anglican Council of Indigenous Peoples, residential school survivors, and those who have much to teach us about living out the gospel of grace and love. May God's blessing be on all of us in this crucial time in the history of this church and this country of Canada. 
blessings, and peace. John. We have posted this on our website, and there are live You can click on um, things that are referenced, like the reports and um, the media. You to do so. <clears throat> Our opening hymn is Sing a New Song Unto the Lord. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. I think I saw some kids on there. Hello. Hello. Good morning. Good to see you guys. At least I can see you over here. (laughs) Because there's nothing on my screen over here. How are you? Have you had a good week? Yeah. 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 Oh, there you are. Good. I'm glad to hear that. Well, this week, not yet. (laughs) Pressing buttons. Uh, This week, I was thinking about one of the the interesting things about growing up and continuing along in the years is you get to think about how things are changing. And some of the things that change is the way we think about things, the way we understand things. So there's lots of things that I used to think years ago but I don't think that anymore. And there's lots of things that we as a whole society used to think, but we don't think anymore. And the reason I was thinking about this is because um, in today's gospel reading, 
we hear about Jesus exercising demons. Now, demons are kind of a scary kind of topic. And in Jesus' day, people used to think that if you got sick, it's because you were possessed by something, like some demon or something had come into your body and it made you sick. We don't think that anymore. We, we think that you get sick because there's germs or something's gone wrong in your body. We don't think it's because of, like, possession. And people used to think that, like, if you had a mental illness, like if you were hearing voices or seeing things that other people weren't seeing, then again, that was because of demons and you needed to be exercised. You needed to have the demon driven out. And we don't really know exactly what causes those things to happen, but we know it's something that's gone wrong inside our bodies. Um, so, and we used to think other things too, like even after that, we used to think, for example, here in Canada, that white people, like me, were better than other people that our culture, our way of doing things was the best way. And so we should make everybody like us. And we know now that that's just not true, that everybody has their own way and everybody is equally important. But we are still living with um, the reality that we kind of set things up that way and a lot of other people were hurt by it. And that's part of what is responsible, it's a major part of what was responsible for the residential schools that you've probably been hearing about in the news, is because we thought as a society, not as individuals, but as our country thought, we should try and make the First Nations people not themselves, but like us. And that we know now that was a very bad thing. It was combining something that was good, like getting an education and going to school, which is an important thing to have, with a desire to kind of treat them badly and abuse them. And that's a very, very, very bad thing. And we used that excuse of a good thing as a way to take them away from their families. And so, we need to think about why, why we think things like that and what would God really want us to think and do before we do things that are going to hurt other people. Does that make sense? Yep. Yeah. So this is our last week for the Going Out song, It Only Takes a Spark. And the reason why we sing a song that says it only takes a spark is because one tiny little spark can start a huge fire. And it's a reminder to us that each of us is a tiny spark that can make a change. So let's, let's sing. Ooh. to accept the challenge of your call so that trusting in your promise we journey by faith in Jesus Christ amen we listen for the word of god
In today's Hebrew Bible lesson, we see that the people of Israel moving towards a new form of government. They have been led by a series of judges who in times of crisis settled disputes and raised armies. Samuel was the last of these judges and a prophet of God, and he is asked by the elders to establish a monarchy. A reading from the first book of Samuel. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, You are old and your children do not follow in your ways. Appoint for us then a king to govern us like other nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to govern us. Samuel prayed to the Lord and the Lord said to Samuel, Listen to the voice of the people in all they say to you. For they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. Just as they have done to me from the day I brought them up out of Egypt to this day, forsaking me, serving other gods, so also they are doing to you. Now then, listen to their voices only. You shall solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king who shall reign over them. So Samuel reported all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking him for a king. He said, These will be the ways of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them to his chariots and to be his horsemen and to run before his chariots. He will take your male and female slaves and the best of your cattle and donkeys and put them to his work. He will take one tenth of your flocks and he, you shall be his slaves. And in that day, you will cry out because of your king, whom you have chosen for yourselves. But the Lord will not answer you in that day. But the people refused to listen to the voice of Samuel. They said, No, but we are determined to have a king over us, so that we may also be like other nations, and that our king will govern us, and go out before us, and fight our battles. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. I will give thanks to you, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods, I will sing your praise. I will bow down toward your holy temple and praise your name. Because of your love and faithfulness for you have glorified your name and your word above all things. When I called, you answered me. You increased my strength within me. All the rulers of the earth will praise you, O Lord. When they have heard the words of your mouth, they will sing of the ways of the Lord. That great is the glory of the Lord. Though you are high, you care for the lowly. You perceive the haughty from afar. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you keep me safe. You stretch forth your hand against the fury of my enemies. Your mighty hand shall save me. O oh Lord, you will make good your purpose for me. Your love endures forever. Do not abandon the works of your hands. Glory to God, source of all being, eternal word and Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The Apostle Paul encouraged believers not to lose heart. He reminds them again that they are involved with the unseen and the eternal, not just the known and the physical. A reading from the second letter of Paul to the church in Corinth. But just as we have the same spirit of faith that is in accordance with the scripture, I believe and so I spoke. We also believe and so we speak because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and will bring us with you into the God's presence 
Yes, everything is for your sake, so that the grace as it extends to more and more people may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. So we do not lose heart, even though our outer nature is wasting away, our inner nature is beginning renewed day by day. From the slight momentary affliction of preparing us for an eternal way of the glory beyond all measures, because we look not at what can be seen, but we cannot be seen. For what can be seen is temporary, but what cannot be seen is eternal. For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house made with hands eternal in the heavens. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. Gradual hymn is many and great, O God, are your works. And also with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. And the crowd came together again, so that they could not even eat. When Jesus' family heard it, they went out to restrain him, for people were saying, He has gone out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, He was Beelzebub. And by the ruler of the demons, he casts out demons. And Jesus called them to him and spoke to them in parables. How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but his end has come. But no one can enter the strong man's house and plunder his property without first tying up the strong man. Then, indeed, the house can be plundered. Truly, I tell you, people will be forgiven for their sins and for whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever uttered blasphemies against the Holy Spirit can never have forgiveness but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they had said, he has an unclean spirit. Then Jesus' mother and his brothers came, and standing outside, they sent to him and called him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, your mother and your brothers and sisters are outside asking for you. And he replied, who are my mother and my brothers? And looking at those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother 
and sister and mother. This is the gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Well, today, in the cycle of the liturgical year, we again move into what we call ordinary time, the season when we focus on discipleship and what it means for us to live as followers of Jesus. This is the season when we focus on the question, how do we live faithfully as people of the resurrection in the midst of a world that's still broken? Now, today's passage takes place very early in Jesus' ministry, and already he's hard at work not only proclaiming the kingdom of God and that it's coming, but also demonstrating what that kingdom will look like by driving out demons and healing illness. And as a result, he's become so popular with the crowds that it's hard for him to even enter the towns, and by today's passage, even to find time to get a bite to eat, all of which, not surprisingly, starts to be noticed by people other than the crowds following him. And so in today's passage, we hear the reaction of two groups who we might think would be the best to understand who Jesus is and what he's about, the religious authorities and his family. But far from recognizing that God is powerfully at work in the actions of Jesus, both groups think he's possessed by something much darker than God. The scribes, the heavy-hitting religious authorities from Jerusalem, come to pass judgment on his ministry. And they take a look at him and quickly decide, nope, not of God. So therefore, in their minds, he must be possessed by demonic forces. Interestingly, they don't dispute that Jesus has real power. They're not claiming that he's a fake. It's just that what he's doing, and more importantly, perhaps how he's doing it, doesn't fit into their understanding of how God should be working. And since in their worldview, there are only two sources of spiritual power, God and Satan, If Jesus is not of God, then he must be possessed by Satan, which is, of course, ironic. But it's not just the religious authorities who can't see Jesus clearly. Even his own family doesn't understand, and they come to restrain him. They think, quite frankly, that he's gone crazy. So while the crowd is drawn in and those willing to see and follow become family, his own family ends up becoming outsiders through their inability to see God at work in him. So what's going on here? How has Jesus' ministry of preaching and teaching and healing created such controversy and friction in such a short period of time. I think in part it's simply because Jesus is so totally not what the religious authorities or his family expect. He doesn't fit neatly into their categories. And when something doesn't fit into the way we understand the world, we typically do label it abnormal or deviant or crazy or wrong. We usually assume that what we hold to be true, what we think, what we have experienced, is what's normal and natural. And so that's the standard by which we measure and judge the thoughts and actions of others. And here's Jesus, teaching and preaching and working wonders with a new kind of power and authority, a new kind of power and authority that neither the religious authorities nor his family can control. 
and they find this disruption of the status quo disturbing. I think sometimes we forget how comforting the status quo can be, even when we don't particularly like it. For example, did you know that winning the lottery is just as stressful and upsetting for most people as losing a loved one? Change, even change for the better, is hard because we are far more comfortable when things stay the same. And I think that's a lot of what's going on here. The scribes are not bad people. They were, for the most part, decent, devout people. In many ways, they're people like us. The problem isn't that they're bad. It isn't that they're opposed to God. They're devoted to doing God's will. They just aren't open to God doing something new and unexpected. They think they already know what God wants. So when Jesus comes along doing something new and outside their understanding of Scripture, they just can't see God in it. And that's a lesson we all need to pay attention to. If even the most godly and faithful people of Jesus' own time, if even his own family weren't able to recognize that God was so strongly at work in Jesus, then how confident can we be that we are recognizing where God is at work in our time and place? Are we able to recognize what God is up to today in our own lives and world? Because looking back at the past, it is abundantly clear that many, many faithful and even well-meaning people have totally messed up in recognizing God's will in their time and place. Not just in one culture or one time or in one way, but over and over again. Now, I wish that there was a simple and straightforward formula that I could give you to figure out God's will. It would be lovely if there was a simple way to just review a checklist and be able to say, yep, that's of God, or nope, not of God. But the short answer is that we don't always know what God is up to, and there is no surefire way to tell when it's God calling us and when it's our own ego or our cultural standards or our own desires that are guiding our actions and decisions. Because, quite frankly, God did not stop doing unexpected and new things 2,000 years ago. God still persists in doing what we don't expect. Indeed, sometimes what we don't particularly want or even think God ought to want. But one touchstone we do have to judge our actions or our intentions is to look at the results. As Jesus says to the scribes, he was acting to overturn the demonic, so how could his actions possibly be powered by Satan? He says, in effect, judge my actions by its fruit. The result of his actions was the building up of the kingdom of God, the kingdom of love and compassion and care. And we too need to look at our actions through that criteria. Does what we do or what we want to do or what we expect or what we think we deserve or need help to build the kingdom of God, help to spread God's radical love or does it just support the status quo? Or worse, does it advantage us while others suffer? Does what we are doing help make the world better for everyone, not just for people like us? 
We need to constantly resist the temptation to try to reduce the gospel to what we like or feel comfortable with or want to happen. To resist reducing being a Christian into just being a nice, law-abiding citizen of our time. After all, many horrible things have been done by nice, law-abiding Christians who are just following the cultural expectations of their time and place. And we need to be open to risk doing things outside our comfort zone when we think God just might possibly be at work in ways that don't match our expectations and desires. If what you want is a faith that affirms the status quo, then Christianity is not what you're looking for. The gospel always upends things, inviting us to see that God has more in store for us than we'd imagined, more than we'd even dared to hope for. God is offering us new life. But new life is threatening precisely because it calls us out of our old life and all the baggage that we've accumulated. But nevertheless, that's the promise of the gospel. New life, new possibilities, new ways of doing things. Not the life we've grown comfortable with, just tweaked a little bit, but new life. So maybe we all need to allow ourselves to be open to at least a little bit of divine craziness. I invite you to prepare yourselves for the prayers of the people. Creator God, our sovereign, you bring us untold riches more rewarding than anything money can buy. You give us the gift of your gospel. May we focus on the truth and wisdom of your words so that we treat all peoples with the dignity and respect that they deserve. Understanding that we are all part of your family and your creation. Amen. To the bidding, God in your mercy, please respond, hear our prayer. God in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of truth, we mourn the lives of 215 Indigenous children found in unmarked graves on the former site of the Kamloops Residential School. We pray for all Indigenous communities, for the parents of children who never returned home, for those whose questions were never answered, for those who spoke up but were ignored, and for those who live every day with the trauma and pain caused by their shameful treatment in the residential school system. We pray for healing, justice, and reconciliation, acknowledging the part religious institutions played in the running of these schools. God, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray for our church leadership, for Linda, our primate, and John, our bishop. We pray that they may continue to lead the church in reconciliation efforts with Indigenous leaders across Canada. We pray for our own leadership here at St. Anne's, for our ordained clergy, Gladys, Gail, and Roberta, our interim priest in charge. We pray for our lady leadership and our staff members, Jonathan and Rachel, 
plus all our volunteers. We pray that in our own parish, we find ways to be informed and involved in the process of reconciliation. God, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray for our national and provincial governments and their role in reconciliation. May they work harder to provide all Indigenous communities with the basic essentials we take for granted, such as clean water. May their policies and work work to provide hope and opportunities for all Indigenous people, especially youth and children. God, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. In our Anglican prayer, we pray for the theological colleges and training program within the ecclesiastical province of Ontario. Canterbury College, Huron College, Renison College, the Anglican Studies Program at St. Paul University, Thornlow University, Trinity College, and Whitworth College. We pray for our companion diocese, the Episcopal Diocese of Northern Philippines, and our partner parishes, St. Anne Basile Proper and St. Ambrose Mission, Sukwib. In the Diocesan Temple of Prayer, we pray for St. Augustine Miracle, St. Mary the Virgin of Alpha, St. Mary the Virgin of Appleton. In our parish cycle of prayer, we pray for Blanche Pichy, John Netcher, Barry and Mary Taylor, Jackie Chibere, Arvin and Mary Walk, and Carmen Hood. God, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We give thanks for our scientists and the vaccines they have created to help us end this global pandemic. We give thanks for our public health officials and their wisdom as they lead us through these challenging times. And we give thanks for all those who are administering the vaccines in our community. We pray that vaccines can be distributed equitably so that all countries are safe from illness and death. God, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We continue to pray for all those whose lives have been caught up in the community of addiction. We mourn lives lost in the overdose crisis. Loving God, we look to all those who feel lost in places of darkness. Walk beside them in their time of need and show how much you care for them. God, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray for all those who are ill in body, mind, or spirit. We pray for all those facing surgery and those who have received difficult news about their health. We pray for caregivers, both family and professional, as they deal with challenging times. We now take a moment to pray, either silently or aloud, for those we are holding in our hearts. God, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Holy God, whose name is not honored, where the needy are not served, and the powerless are treated with contempt. May we embrace our neighbor with the same tenderness that we, are, we ourselves require, so that your justice may be fulfilled in love. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, amen. We are going to do a litany for the healing and restoration of our church. Holy Creator, in whom all things in heaven and earth have their being, have mercy on us. Risen Christ, through whom the whole creation is reconciled to God, have mercy on us. Life-giving Spirit, whose love and truth fills the world and searches the depth of our lives, have mercy on us. Blessed Trinity, source of both unity and diversity, have mercy on us. From our failure to recognize and respect the revelation of your truth and love in the first peoples of this land, Savior, forgive and heal us. From our participation in the systemic oppression of indigenous sovereignty, language, culture, and spirituality, Savior, forgive and heal us. From our role in the Indian residential schools designed to eliminate 
the unique society, wisdom, and beauty of the indigenous peoples of this land. Savior, forgive and heal us. From our complicit tolerance of the decimation of indigenous family structures, leaving children vulnerable to abuses of every kind. Savior, forgive and heal us. From our continued acceptance of unjust legal, educational, health, and social structures, that continue to oppress and destroy the lives of many indigenous peoples. Savior, forgive and heal us. O oh God, we pray for the gifts of your grace and your love, which never gives up on us and is forever faithful. Inspire our minds with a vision of the reconciliation of your kingdom in this time and place. Hear us, O oh Christ. Touch our eyes, that we may see the sacredness in all creation. Hear us, O Christ. Touch our ears, that we may hear from every mouth of every peoples the hunger for hope and stories of refreshment. Hear us, O Christ. Touch our lips, that we may speak of the beauty of every tongue and dialect proclaiming the wonderful works of God. Hear us, O Christ. Touch our hearts, that we may discern your mission in what you call us to be immersed, particularly in partnership with the first peoples of this land. Hear us, O Christ. Touch our minds, that we may witness to your good news in our neighborhoods, communities, and all parts of the world. Hear us, O Christ. Touch our hands, that we may forever shun violence and embrace the work you give us to do. Hear us, O Christ. Draw your church together, O Lord, into one great company of disciples, together following our Lord Jesus Christ into every walk of life, together serving you in your mission in the world, and together witnessing to your love on every continent and island of your creation. We ask this in the name of the risen Christ, in whom we are one. Amen. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, God is steadfast in love and infinite in mercy, welcoming sinners and inviting us to share the abundance of divine love. Let us confess our sins, confident in God's forgiveness. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you. Pardon and deliver you from all your sins. Confirm and strengthen you in all goodness and keep you in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. My sisters and brothers in Christ, may the peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with also you or with you. God sees all things. God sees our comings and our goings, our strengths and our weaknesses, our needs and our desires. God sees in us the potential we do not yet see in ourselves. I invite you to share your gifts out of the abundance that is God's vision for us. Our offertory hymn is Come My Way, My Truth, My Life.
Blessed are you, O God, ruler of heaven and earth. Day by day, you shower us with blessings. As you have raised us to new life in Christ, give us glad and generous hearts, ready to praise you and to respond to those in need. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. As our Savior taught us, let us pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. May God bless you with discomfort, discomfort at easy answers, half-truths, and superficial relationships so that you may live deep within your heart. May God bless you with anger, anger at injustice, oppression, and exploitation of people so that you may work for justice, freedom, and peace. May God bless you with tears, tears to shed for those who suffer from pain, rejection, starvation, and war so that you may reach out your hand to comfort them and turn their pay into joy. May God bless you with foolishness, enough foolishness to believe that you can make a difference in this world so that you can do what others claim cannot be done. And the blessing of God who creates, redeems, and sanctifies be upon you and all whom you love and pray for this day and forevermore. Amen. Our closing hymn is, Will You Come and Follow Me? into the world in peace and love, serving God in all you do. Thanks be to God. Thanks for joining us, everyone. <laughs>